Come on, sing. All I want is for you to be glorified. Lift up your name. We lift up your name, Lord. All I want is for you to be glorified. You can lift those hands right there. Listen. Good morning, D.C. How are you? How are you? How are you? 
Are you guys just so happy to be here? Are you? Oh, I love that. I love that response. I love that response. If you are exci as excited to be here as I am, stand to your feet. Look around. See the people that are around you. Wave on over. Say, hey, good morning. How you doing? How was your weekend? You all right? Your weekend was well? All right. Now, I want to know, are you guys here to worship this morning? Are you guys here to worship this morning? Well, if you are here to worship this morning, go ahead and put your hands together for me. Let's get excited for Jesus this morning because he is our risen Savior and our King. Right? There we go. You guys.
thank you, God, for being so good. Not just today, but for yesterday, today, and forevermore. Father, we thank you. Majestic is your name in all the earth. Your glory be said higher than the heavens. The sky is strange from the mouth of infants still the enemy. The moon and stars. And place by Who am I that you are mindful of me? Oh Lord.
Majestic is your name in all the earth. How majestic is the name of the Lord. Do you guys agree with that? Do you guys agree that he's our healer, our savior, our master, our redeemer? He is so good and he is so kind to us. So kind to allow us to have teachers and instructors who are back there ready and waiting with open arms for our babies and take them on in the class to show them just who our redeemer and who our king is. We're so excited. Oh, we going a little fast this morning, all right? I guess he's trying to keep the energy up. Here we go. Hey, we love our kids. We love our kids in you. We love our kids. We love our kids. Kids in you. <laughs> what up, DCC? If you love Jesus, can you make a little bit of noise? Well, if I have not had the opportunity of meeting you, my name is Jerry Wagner. I'm the lead pastor here of Disciple City Church, and it is an honor to do life with my siblings and also guests. Well, this is the moment that we get a chance to highlight Black History Month here at Disciple City Church. This year, we wanted to focus on uh, black leaders, black pastors in the community in Dallas, Texas. So we got a chance to look at um, Dr. Um, Tony Evans the first day. We got a chance to look at Pastor Vincent Parker of uh, um, Golden Gate Missionary Baptist Church. This week, we get a chance to see uh, Pastor Chris Simmons of Cornerstone Baptist Church in South Dallas. And so we get a chance to highlight one of my heroes in the faith. And um, when we bought this building, uh, one of the persons that I called was him. I said, Pastor Chris, can, can you come to the building, man? I just want to do vision with you. And he came here, and we just walked the building and just prayed and just talked about vision. And just a very, very insightful man. So uh, there was a lot of things in this uh, his interview that I wanted to show, so we will show the whole interview, but this particular one is dealing with, you know, the necessity of the black church and um, his thoughts on that. So let's take a look at the video. We need the, why do we need the black church? I think we need to look historically at the role of the black church. And one of the things that, you know, that really, um, I think that speaks volumes about the the black church historically was it was the cornerstone in communities. Um, individuals who were uh, laborers and janitors and sweep streepers, sweep street sweepers, and had uh, and they were boys and gals. But when they went to church, they were deacons and deaconess and presidents and um, of, of organizations, and they, they took that role and responsi responsibility very seriously. And I think that the black church in these communities had a very important role in lifting up the dignity of those in the community, whereas society all around them saw them with no value and no worth and no significance that the black church saw them as somebody who was very important and that their role was so significant. And I think that, um, that over the years that individuals have attempted to say that those roles are not significant and important. I think they're very much significant and important. Now more so as ever before, that individuals who are oftentimes viewed as rejects the outcast, the least of these, need to know that there is a place where they can be accepted, that they can serve, that they can give, that the world might reject you, but there is a place in God's kingdom for you, and you have a very significant task and importance in that. And so I think the role of the black church continues to be very strong, particularly in communities in inner city neighborhoods um, where there is a lot of chaos and confusions in our community. And I think the answers to solving a lot of the community problems are within the community. So good. He said a lot of things. 
Um, but a couple of things that I want to highlight as we continue to pass out communion is notice he talked about where you found your identity. You know, even when the world rejects us, tries to label us, stereotype us, the church should be the place where the Imago Dei is lifted up. The church should be the place where you, as an image bearer of God, is reminded of your significance um, in the Father's love and also in this community. Even when you think about the multi-ethnic church, one of the things that you clash with is identity, trying to find who you are. But as Pastor Chris Simmons reminded us, even in regards to the black church, it was in those communities when Jim Crow, segregation, um, uh, the 13th Amendment, all those different things that were against the black community, all of a sudden they found significance in the church. And that's my hope for us as we continue to navigate what it means to be in the context and community with people that don't look like us, don't talk like us, that our, our starting point would be Christ, that our starting point would be the Imago Dei, that even when we sing songs as simple as this, that you don't feel like you can't worship God because another group might look at you and be like, ah, we don't worship like that, you know. And so I'm just very grateful for the deposit of the black church and to continue to learn from um, the black church and the things that have, as Pastor uh, Parker talked about, uh, it has just been a light on what it means to be in the context of community. All right. I love that that we could be in community together, you know. So um, all this is possible because of what Jesus Christ did 2,000 years ago. And so when we take communion, we are reminded that his death not only brought salvation vertically between a holy God and sinful men, but it also brought reconciliation to neighbors. Um, and, and now, you know, um, we're going to be family forever. Revelation 7, 9 says... John saw every tongue and nation and tribe, like, you know, and if he saw that in heaven as a vision, my thing has always been, then why wait to go to heaven to experience that? Why can't we experience it now? So as we take the bread, repeat after me, the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let us eat. Likewise, the cup, repeat after me, the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let us drink. Amen. Let us continue to worship our King. Hallelujah belongs to you. 
Bless your name, Lord. All of our hallelujahs and amens belong to you, God, because it's, there is none more worthy, there is none more holy, and there is none more righteous than you, Father. We are so excited for you, our King. Amen. Today's scripture reading is for, from Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 through chapter 2, verse 4. Just one thing. As citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I will hear about you that you are standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel, not being frightened in any way by your opponents. This is a sign of their destruction for them, but of your salvation, and this is from God. For it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are engaged in the same struggle that you saw that I had and now hear that I have, if, there, if then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, unified, unified, united in the spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Amen. Thank you, Cynthia. Thanks, y'all, for playing and singing. Can y'all give it up for them one more time and say thank you? And the Lord deserves it, don't he? Can we just give it up for the Lord a little bit? Is there anybody who's got something they're grateful for? Just gratitude. Just, I just feel marked by gratitude. I'm grateful that I get the opportunity in just like nine days to start up something that I get to do every year, every spring. This is my third time doing it. I get to be a soccer coach. Oh, uh, would y'all just like coaches or soccer? Like, what is this? I didn't know we had any soccer aficionados. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. You're great. Sade, I can always count on you. Uh, but yeah, I get the privilege. I mean, it's, it's legitimately an honor. I do get paid also, which is just bananas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We love money. Yes, yes, we do. Uh, it's something that I would do for free if the time was, was, was there. But the fact that I get paid to do something that I love so much in a context that I love so much just feels like one of God's greatest gifts to me. And let me just ask you this question. Have you ever had a good coach? Has anybody in this place ever had a good coach? A good coach, you guys are just, okay. I feel like there's, we're at a sporting event. We, we're loud today. Uh, good coaches make, make a big difference. Have you ever had a, a not so good coach? Maybe even a bad coach? I've had a... <laughs> <laughs> was he? Uh, yeah, you know, anyways, okay. Double A comes to mind. Uh, if you've had a bad coach, you know how much a, a, of a difference that can make. And if you've had a good coach, you know how much of a difference that can make. Uh, I don't know. I know I'm not a bad coach. I don't know if I'm a good coach. But I will say this. I know what I bring to the table. You know what I'm saying? And I know what I'm there to do. It matters. And I'm going somewhere. I'm not just telling you about myself for no reason. Uh, one of the things that I think happens is that my gifts, I think God has gifted me with administration and exhortation. I could put things together and I could charge us up to get there. 
Those are things that work really well in a coaching context. I know who I am, I know what I bring to the table, and I know what I'm there to do, which makes a lot of things very easy, okay? Hold on to those things. Another piece of this is that I just, I feel like I'm able to give a little bit of direction, a little bit of vision, you could say. So the players who are 10, 11, and 12, some of them, I am not playing with you, travel the globe playing soccer. Some of them can't spell soccer. <laughs> they have one foot. Uh, not literally. It's, you know, it's fine. They are just not the most talented. It's an interesting place to play, but you have different skill levels, and so I give direction that meets every player where they are. I want them to enjoy the game, I want them to enjoy each other, and I want them to enjoy the God that has given us both the game and the team to play it with. It's simple, and if you enjoy, you will grow every single day. That's what I tell them. And so from that place, I say, why you are here is the crest on your chest. You are here because you're connected to something that's bigger than you. The crest that you wear represents not just you, not just your family, but it represents all those who have gone before you who've worn that crest. It represents those who started this school, who continue this school going, those who contribute financially so the school can be there, those who attend the school, and it represents the community, not just your family, not just your friends, not just your teammates, but the community in which the school is. I get the privilege of coaching at West Dallas Community School. Are there any warriors in this place? All right, there's one of my players right there. What's up? Wave for the people. Wave for the people. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna, you're gonna raise a trophy? I want you to imagine it. Can you raise a trophy for me? All right, she, she was doing it. That's what I'm talking about, Eva. You go, Eva. Uh, but I get the privilege of coaching at this school. We've been a part of it for almost a decade now as a family. And it's an incredible place. They get really excited about it. And so do I. One of the things that happens, though, is that I tell them, what do warriors do? We're a family, and we're a family of warriors, but what do warriors do? Eva, one last thing. What do warriors do? Warriors fight. I tell them 17 different ways from Sunday, over and over and over and over again. I don't care if you win. I care if you fight. I don't care if you win. I care if you fight. If you don't fight, you will sit. In Jesus' name. <laughs> and when, when, a, when a player comes to me and they missed a pass, they missed a gimme of a, of a goal. They let somebody buy them. The goalie lets the ball in the net. They, they, touch, the hand, they touch the ball with their hand or they punch somebody. I had a kid punch somebody on the field. You, I'm telling you, it's all over the place. Come and watch a game. It's crazy. Uh, but when they come to me and they feel like they've failed, they feel this very particular thing. They feel like they don't measure up. Like they are not worth the crest on their chest. Like they are somehow less able to wear it. Like they don't belong. They don't measure up. And I have the privilege of looking at these sweet babies in their faces and saying, if you don't think you measure up, you don't know who you are. Because what do I ask of you? Do I tell you you can't make mistakes? Do I tell you that you have to win? No. What do warriors do? Warriors fight. And when you fail, your teammate will fight for you. They'll fill in the gap for you. All you have to do is fight. What they forget is who they are. When they don't feel like they measure up, it's because they've forgotten who they are, how they got there, what stitches them together, how they get to participate and be a part of the team. And I bring up this team because I think that there are times in life when we as Christians feel some similar stuff. Not so much, not so much the coaching or the playing, but as a Christian, I wonder if maybe today or another day you have felt like you don't measure up. 
Like you don't have what it takes. Like you're not cut out for this. Like you have one leg. Like you just don't get to travel the globe doing this thing. Or like you can't carry your weight. You might be telling yourself, I don't, I don't measure up, Jesus. I just keep falling. I just keep stumbling. I can't put two and two together. I don't know what it is you want from me. I don't measure up. If you've ever felt that way, you're in good company. I would have you raise your hands, but I don't want us all to raise our hands yet. We'll just save that for a different point. But my, my thought for you today is that if you feel like you don't measure up, it's because, not because you've failed, not because you feel like you don't see the success or the growth or the progress that you're looking for, it's very simply because you've forgotten who you are. Today, I want us to ask and answer the question, how do I live a life that's worthy of the gospel? Which is a, a trick question, and I'll explain that in a minute. But how do I live a life that's worthy of the gospel? Have you ever wondered about that? How do I live in Jesus in a way that is like worth Jesus? Like, what am I supposed, how do I do this thing? How can I possibly measure up to Jesus? Perfect, God of the universe. This is crazy. What, what is this supposed to look like? How do I measure up? How do I live a life that is worthy of the gospel? We're in Family Ties. It's a series on the book of Philippians. Uh, thank you, Cynthia, for reading. We're going to be in those verses. And last week, Pastor Jerry was up here, and he asked the question, what do you live for? And today I want to answer the question, well, how do you know? If you're living for Jesus, how do you know if you're living for Jesus, that your life is worthy of such a high call? And I love that Paul's energy, his emotion, is so encouraging. It's so optimistic. He is believing the best of those Christians who are in Philippi, and he urges them on to their goal. Paul is a coach in today's passage. And here's the simple way that we're going to move through this passage, okay? Citizens of heaven are unified, unafraid, and unselfish. Citizens of heaven are unified, unafraid, and unselfish. I promise. I try to get as far away from alliteration as possible. But just like the Lord, there's nowhere I can go where it won't find me. So... The first point today is that citizens of heaven are unified. Say unified. unified. Citizens of heaven are unified. Now, look at verse 27. We're going to start here. We're going to hang out here for a second. Philippians 1, 27. Paul says just one thing. Only. Paul, Paul wants you to really hold on to this one very weighty, important thing that he's about to say. Now, let me tell you something that he does not say, but I'm going to make it make sense why it says this. Paul does not say, as citizens of heaven. That's not in his Greek text. This is a translational choice. I like it. So if you're wondering, like, what, what is, what's going on here? I'll tell you how they got there. But citizens of heaven is not in the Greek. What is in the Greek is the verb live life. Okay, you say how it says live your life? But Paul is using a very particular term there that is connoting how to conduct yourself as a citizen. Uh, later on in this book, I think it's, and I'm getting ahead of myself, I try not to, you know, but it is what it is. In chapter 3, I think it's verse 20, Paul says, you're citizens of heaven. And then he kind of has some things around that. This is the same term. It's just as a verb. And Paul is giving them a command to live like citizens of heaven. That's what he's saying. And it's real nice. I'm going to tell you why Paul's real nice, but I want to give you that. So hold on to this idea of citizens of heaven. We're going to talk about it, all right? Uh, but what he's saying is to be enculturated. As a citizen, I need you to carry the culture of where you're from. Oh, man. I'm excited about this one. You are marked by the king. You are a part of his kingdom. And wherever you go, the culture of the kingdom goes with you. Oh, <laughs> that's exciting for me, but maybe not for you. That's all right. We go, we, maybe you'll come with me in a second, okay? But then he says, worthy. I need you to live your life 
worthy of the gospel. Worth is found based on something's value, or sometimes it would be based on weight. So I'll give you this thing for this much gold, right? I'll trade you this very expensive fabric for this much, you know, currency or whatever like that. So sometimes scales were needed to assess the worth of something, if something was worthy. A picture here is that Paul puts these scales on the table and he says, all right, I'm going to put the gospel on one side and I'm going to put your life on the other side. And will they balance out? The answer is, is obvious, right? The answer is like, nah, like of course not. The gospel is way weightier. It's worth way more than my life could ever bring. That's kind of the point. But before I really just let us off the hook, think about it for a second. Paul wants you to really consider if how you are conducting yourself is worthy of all that God went through to make you his own. God handpicked you and brought you into his kingdom to be a part of his commonwealth, to be a citizen in his country. And are you marked by that kingdom, that culture? Is your life a picture of what God's kingdom looks like? That is what Paul wants us to see. Now, I will tell you, I don't know if you know this, but the gospel is its own counterweight. You never earned your place in the kingdom to start with. So if you're in the kingdom and you're saying, but Ryan, I don't measure up, I need you to know that that's not the point. God has rigged the scales. That's the whole point of the gospel. There's no amount of anything that you could do to prove that you are worth his love. He loved you at your worst, and you're not getting much better. And any better that you get is because of him in the first place. This is such good news. Anyone who has a, anyone who's a card-carrying citizen of God's country is only so because of Jesus. It's such good news. And the gospel is so big and so strong that it changes our identities. It shifts our citizenship. You are different where you call home is different. Where you belong is different. The benefits that you get are different. But it's not just you. This is a communal identity. You're not by yourself. This isn't just about your life, your citizenship. It's about this new community, this new commonwealth, this new family that you have joined. Paul is making an appeal to the Christian Philippian nationalism, their sense of nationalism. Philippi, you may have said this, I've, I've forgotten, my apologies. Philippi is a Roman province. Philippi is like annexed into the, the, the Roman, uh, the, the nation of Rome. So they get certain privileges based on pledging their allegiance to Rome. Rome is the world power at the time, right? Rome has all this money, all this military, all of these protections, all of these amenities. And if you just simply pledge your allegiance to Caesar, then you get to participate. You know, it, it, is, it, is it making sense yet? You get certain privileges by pledging your allegiance to Rome. And Paul is saying, now listen, because sometimes here's what Paul will do. He'll say, walk. Have you, have you seen this? Paul says, walk. He's saying, you know, let your conduct be a certain way, live a certain way. But Paul does a little something extra here. He puts some more sauce on his term where he says, I need y'all to live like citizens of a higher country. Now, look, I know y'all are a part of the, the whole Rome situation. That's great. That's grand. You got a lot of things that you could get. But what if I told you that you were a citizen of heaven? What if you were part of a higher country, a greater nation? with better benefits, with a stronger sense of government, with eternity, eternity ahead of it. This, this kingdom will never falter. That's not so true of, the, of Rome. Like, it didn't really pan all the way out. Okay. All right. Paul says, if you are living worthy of this kingdom, then I'm going to find you a specific way. 
you'll be marked by some stuff. If that's how I find you, and I believe that I will, I'm going to find you marked by some things. When I'm coaching, I tell the team, go together. It's just one of the things that I say all the time. Go together. Sometimes I've got kids who think they can run the whole field by themselves. They get trapped in the corner. But if they were to go together, to go with a teammate, if a teammate who's not on the ball was to go with someone who had the ball, then we might be a little bit more dangerous. I'll spare you all of the, like, IQ stuff. I just say go together. And some of us need to remember to go together. Paul says, if you're living worthy, I'm going to find you unified. He says, I will hear about you that you are standing firm in one spirit, in one accord. The idea, the picture here is of a military a military that's immovable. It doesn't matter what army you bring against them. They can handle whatever battle. They can handle whatever war because they're, they're standing firm. Immovable. But they're not standing firm by themselves. This ain't boxing. This ain't battle royale and wrestling, uh, which isn't even real. I don't know. But it's a picture of a military, and they have their shields. I'm not condoning this movie. I just think that it often gives a great picture of what I'm talking about. You may have seen 300. Uh, this is Sparta. Yeah, so uh, they f have this one particular scene where they set up in this channel, and they put their shields up, and they move as a unit. And their shield isn't for themselves. It's for the person standing next to them. I fight for the person on one side of me, and I protect for a person on the other side. And I'm trusting that the person next to me is protecting me. And they move side by side as one unit. That's a picture of what's here. There's one more piece of 300 that I think is really helpful. There's the, the guy, uh, if you've seen the movie, great. If you haven't seen the movie, movie, probably just don't watch it. Okay, maybe just don't. If you do, it wasn't my idea. It's your idea. But there's this one guy in particular who was thrown out of the, the, the community. And he wasn't able to participate in the military, really wanted to. This is my DNA, man. This is who I am. But he wasn't able to carry his shield. He wasn't able to lift his shield. He was a little bit, uh, for, he was formed a little bit differently, and he, he didn't have the strength to lift a shield. So he couldn't protect the person next to him. He wanted to fight because of himself. He wanted to be on the front lines. He didn't want good for everybody. He wanted good for himself, which I can understand. He wanted to belong. I get that, but he didn't want to play his part in the belonging. The reason why I say that is because Paul says stand firm in one spirit, in one accord. There's not a whole lot of room for isolation when you're unified, P part of uh, Paul's point here. And then he says contending together for the faith of the gospel. The idea here would be battle, right, or athletics, that you're striving, you're pushing, you're advancing, but it's not just a fight. It's for the gospel. Here's my question. Are you doing mission insulated or isolated? Are you on mission in a way that is unified? What that might look like is maybe you work with some other folks at the same spot and y'all get to do mission together. But I would guess that on the whole, the majority of us don't experience that. Now, you might have other believers that are at your workplace or in your neighborhood and y'all are striving together, but I'm talking like right here in this gathering of our body, when you're on mission, you might be by yourself. And my question is when you're by yourself, are you insulated or are you isolated? Because if you're isolated, then you're saying, I got it by myself. If you're insulated, you might be by yourself but you are not doing it by yourself. Let me, let me see if I can paint the picture here. Uh, who is with you? You might say, well, the answer is nobody. All right. But who's aware of where you are, what you're chasing, what you're pursuing, how you're advancing? Do they know the names of the people that you're praying for, that you're speaking with? Do you have people who are aware of what it looks like to be on mission where you are? Are they praying with you? Hey, guys, pray with me. I'm having this lunch with this person. I'm having this dialogue with what have you. Who's giving advice? Who is your partner? Like we talked about in the first sermon. 
who's partnering with you, who's pursuing partnership with you on mission. Because God doesn't have, I'm about to speak ill of my teams, God doesn't have Lone Rangers. He doesn't have Mavericks. I have my Mavs, you know, God's team this year. It's not too late to get on the train. But God doesn't have Lone Rangers, people who can handle it by themselves, who call ISO and just like, never mind. I'm going to get to basketball. If I keep going, I'm going to get to basketball. But the gospel, thankfully, brings unity. This isn't something that you have to accomplish on your own. This isn't something that you have to bring about in your own strength. The gospel, what God has done to make King Jesus fully able to bring about the future, the scope of the gospel, and all that Jesus did in his ministry on earth, accomplishing the righteousness on our behalf, taking the punishment that we deserve on the cross, raising to life to defeat sin and death, all of that is enough to bring unity because he didn't just secure salvation, relationship with God, unity with God for you. He also secured it for all of our siblings in here. The gospel, just by nature of being in the family of God, brings unity. So you don't have to really work all that hard to bring unity about. All you have to do is live it out. It's not up to you. Jesus has already done all that needs to be done. It's simply a gift that you get to receive. Live in unity. Live unified. All right, I'm at this point. Here's the second point. Not only are citizens of heaven unified, citizens of heaven are unafraid. They're unafraid. Of what? Here, here's the first thing. They're unafraid of their opponents. In verse 28... Paul says, not being frightened in any way by your opponents. There it is. Uh, I think it would be easy to say that we think, well, I don't technically have any opponents. I don't have any enemies, and I would hope to agree. Like, that's 100%. But sometimes if we're about that action, if we're on mission, there might be people who don't necessarily see eye to eye with us. Might have a little bit of a difference in our beliefs. Uh... They may not see eye to eye on Jesus or some of the, the demands that Jesus might have on those who follow him. It's, there's a cost. And I bring that up to say, technically, technically, you don't have opponents. Jesus does. Now, granted, you're a part of the kingdom, so now you've taken on Jesus' opponents. But those who oppose Jesus oppose Jesus, not you. You just get to feel the opposition. I'm going to come back to that in a second, so just hold, just hold on to that for a second. But the reason I talk about Jesus is because he gets to define our family, and we like that. But if he defines family, he also defines our foes. Like, he defines our opposition. We don't have that privilege. Are you tracking? We don't get to pick our siblings. You, if you have biological siblings, you were born into a family. <laughs> Some of us love that. We love the family we were born into. Others of us may not love what we were born into. Some of us are just like, all right, this is what I got. Let's rock, you know. Uh, that's how my family feels about me, you know. They have to put up with me all the time. Uh, but you don't get to pick your siblings. Same thing is true in the kingdom of God. You chose Jesus. You didn't necessarily choose all, all this, but this is what you got. This is family for you now. And the same thing is true of those who are considered opponents. Jesus defines that. So when we are tempted to take that de defining into our own hands, when we forget that he is our king, that we're a part of a kingdom, we might get sucked into giving opposition, giving opponent status to those who are like, not in our country, you know, or not in our party. Maybe they're not in the same affinity groups. They, like, root for the Steelers. I'm just kidding. I don't care about sports that much. Uh, I'm a coach. Like, I'm like, yes, I do. You know, it's fine. Uh, but we might take on lesser opposition. We might get a little caught up on things that we have decided instead of Jesus. We have not yielded to him in defining that. 
But Paul says if you are ten toes down for, his, for Jesus' kingdom, that it doesn't matter what the opponents look like, what they're on about, that you have a gift to be unafraid. But you're not just unafraid of opposition and opponents. You're unafraid of a general suffering. That's the word that Paul uses in verse 29. He says, it's been granted to you not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. So I think we could all agree that believing in Jesus is a gift. Is anybody just so glad to be in Jesus? Is anybody so grateful for the faith that we have received as a gift, as Paul would describe it here in this passage and a couple of others, that we've received this gift of faith? That is so incredible, clapping of hands, raising our hands, we worship, we sing, you don't have to do that right now. But, but then Paul does this thing, you know, he does this, this real sleight of hand move where he's like, aha, suffering is also a gift. And we're like, no, we don't really have an argument. But Paul says that being in Jesus means that you have a gift to be received, and being unafraid of suffering. Now, that don't mean you have to have a martyr complex. You don't have to chase suffering. Here in this passage, it's really a circumstance. Paul is telling the Philippians, you saw me struggle, and now you're in the same struggle that you saw that I have and here that I'm currently having. Paul says, you are receiving a gift in your current suffering. He doesn't say, go chase the gift. He doesn't say make suffering. He doesn't say let your political ideology be something that you think is being persecuted and make yourself out to be somebody who's persecuted. I'm a persecuted populist. He's not saying none of that. I don't know that any one of us is really suffering in the way that Paul is describing here. But we get little slivers. We get little degrees of suffering. And Paul says when you are rejected... When you are opposed, when someone disagrees with you, when they push back, when they stop responding to you, when they don't want to go sit next to you at the work lunch anymore, those are slivers of suffering. And Paul says you are receiving a gift because you are being identified with Christ. You are getting to sit in a space that Jesus sat in all of the time. He came to his own and his own didn't receive him. And you get to experience that. You get to be known by Christ in that. You get to know Jesus in that space. And Paul says it's a gift. It is a gift. Reminds you that you belong to him. That he is with you in it. And that he teaches you through it. And he uses it not only as a testimony to other believers, but as a sign to those who don't believe. That's what he says, and I'm just going to let it breathe. A sign of what? A sign that God is, is real. That when we are ten toes down in the face of someone's disagreement and rejection, that it tells that our God is real. There's this team that we played my first season. Uh, did we, matter of fact, uh, Chandler, can you put up that first picture where I'm like really talking to the team? I'm really talking to them. That's, that's, that's me, and that's my first ever sixth grade crowd. Uh, that, was a fun, that was a fun season. Uh, I'm pretty sure that in this game, we're playing the Goliath of the league. Uh, I'm talking they would smash everybody like five, ten points. Just hang some goals on some people. It was awful. And it was just unstoppable. It didn't matter what I did. You just kind of sit over there and kick the turf and just like, all right, yeah, good job, guys. Like, dang. No, I'm kidding. But... Uh, yeah, that's the team. So you can take that down. That team right there would play this Goliath team. They were the Mustangs. We played them, I think, three times. The first game of the season, I think it was like 11 to 1. The next time, I think it was about the same. So you can imagine any time my teams heard that they were playing the Mustangs, it was like <laughs> deflating. <laughs> they would just crumble. They were so... So sad because they just knew what was coming. And I would tell them, no, if you, we do these three things, then we have a chance. Just remember, it's all about mentality, blah, blah, blah. I don't care if you win. I care if you fight. But I would say, don't sweat it. You can do this. 
you can do this. Remember who you are. And Paul is saying something mad similar. He's saying, look, you have a fear of something. Your fear is yours. It's not your neighbor's. You have to decide what your fear is when it comes to being on mission, when it comes to rejection. You have a fear of something. It could be rejection. It could be loss of some kind, a sense of loss that you're going to experience when you stand with Christ, or some pain, or some embarrassment. All of those things are so valid, 100%. And the grief that will come with that is very real. Paul is not at all interested in invalidating your struggle, your pain, your grief. He's just giving you a gift, reminding you that you can be unafraid. That doesn't mean that you're not aware of what's coming and knowing that you'll have to experience those things, walk through them, process them, come to the other side of them, whatever that might be. But he's telling you that you could have the gift of knowing that and not being afraid of it. Wild. How is it possible? Because the gospel brings bravery. It's not something that you have to muster on your own. It's not something that you have to bring about. You can look to Jesus' example where he sat in the garden of Gethsemane and prayed and wept and begged God to take what he was about to walk through from him. There's no part of that that feels easy. But he said, all right, Lord, not my will but yours. He yielded to what was in front of him. He yielded to the call that he had. And similarly, we get to hold on to the example that we have in Jesus and know that he is with us. And this is a space where we get to be with him, to walk with him, to be known by him, and to be powered through by him. The gospel brings bravery. So Paul says, live in bravery. Live unified. Live unafraid. But there's one more thing. This one is more of a concern. We might accidentally end up fighting the wrong fight. Instead of fighting something out there, which makes it sound like a culture war, and that's not my intent, but instead of being on mission and having opponents who are in the world, I don't really like to think about people who don't know Jesus as opponents. You don't have to. But we're more comfortable. Dang. We're, we're more comfortable making foes out of our family than we are calling actual foes foes. That's crazy to me. It is easier for us to put a target on a sibling's back than it is for us to go and stand in the world for Jesus. Wow. The problem isn't that we have tension in the family. Tension is inevitable and it's a good thing. The problem is why we have the tension. And Paul says that citizens of heaven are unselfish. We're unified, we're unafraid, and we're unselfish. And Paul bets his argument, whatever he's about to say, on the benefits of being in Christ, on the benefits of belonging to this community. He says four ifs. And he's assuming that all of these things are happening, that they are true, that they are realized. But in those four ifs, he gives you five things. Encouragement, consolation, fellowship, affection, and mercy. You could say exhortation, solace, intimacy, craving, like this longing for your siblings, craving community, and compassion. And he charges them not just to have experienced these things, but to reach for more, to experience some more of it. And what he's about to say, he says, look, I bet that you guys have experienced this. And if so, I want you to to keep going. And what he says to keep going in is in verse 2. He says, make my joy complete by thinking the same way. The imperative here is make complete, which is an incomplete command. He's saying, I will be overjoyed if you do something. What will Paul be overjoyed by? It's that Christians are thinking the same way. There's a, let me see if I need to say anything else. No, I don't. There's a quote, a guy named David Garland. 
He said, out of the 23 times that this verb is used in Paul's letters, 10 of them are in Philippians. Paul is concerned about what they think because he assumes that their right thinking will affect their living. He also assumes that their thinking is done in community. One cannot think the same thing in isolation from others. And he doesn't impose, can we, can we all just pause, get this next sentence? He does not impose on them an obligation to agree on everything, but wants them to be intent on one person, to have the same priorities. We do not all have to agree on every tiny issue. Pastor Jerry and I don't agree on every issue. Me and Drew probably don't. Ryan and Brig probably don't. We don't have to agree on everything to have unity. But he's not just talking about unity here. He says if you want unity, you need to have humility. If you want to be unified, you have to be humble. And actually, uh, in verse 3, it says do nothing. That's an implied verb. There's not really a verb there. But they're implying the wrong verb. This is cold. Oh, this is so good. The same verb, thinking is implied in verse 3. Instead of saying do nothing, the idea is even stronger. Don't even think any thoughts that are motivated by selfish ambition. That is incredible. And this idea of selfish ambition is like pursuing a political office for your own gain by strife and struggle. That you don't care about anyone else. You're just chasing this, this platform, this power, this thing. It's just this motivation for me. Paul says, don't even think that way among the body. So then what is the same way that he's asking us to think? He says, in humility, I got to turn my page, sorry. Consider others more important than yourselves. Everyone, how? Because everyone should be looking not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Paying careful attention, spending my energy on your concern, that I spend myself on you, that I have a vested interest in your life, in your well-being. So you could say, I'm not supposed to be minding my business all the time. And some of us, I think, might be minding our business all the time. But Paul says you need to be minding your sibling's business a little bit. That doesn't mean that you're out gossiping and trying to get all the tea. and what, That's not what Paul is putting forward. He is saying that we spend ourselves for our siblings. That is Paul's point here. And that comes from a place of humility. I think that if the enemy wants to target our unity, he has to come for our humility. I think he loves it when we get blinders on, like racehorses. Don't look this way, don't look that way, just keep looking, keep trucking, duck your head down. Yeah, nose to the grindstone. It's just a season. It's just a season. This won't be forever. You just, you just need a little bit more time for yourself. You just need a little. Paul is telling us that we need humility. Wouldn't it be nice if the enemy could just have me focusing more on me, that I could just have a little bit more selfishness. Because that's how we can easily get a little bit nitpicky. My preference, my opinion, my ministry, my life group. Me, 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 my, 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 now, 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 now. <gasps> Name that movie. Hook. All right. All right, all right, all right. Just movie dropping today. But if we get nitpicky, if we get petty, then we can't stand each other. And if we can't, if we can't stand together, we cannot stand together if we cannot stand each other. It's just not possible. And then we get even more divisive. We begin to draw lines. We begin to make foes of our family members. And the enemy has won. He has gotten us divided. 
He's gotten us disrupted in our unity, and if we're contending against each other, then he stops us from contending for the gospel. If we are fighting for each other, then we are not fighting for the gospel. If we're trying to advance our own agendas in the church house, then we cannot be out sharing the gospel at our house or at our neighbor's house or wherever we're working. If we are so focused on us, if I am so caught up with me, then I cannot be caught up with Christ. And I cannot be contributing, contending to the advance of his gospel, which is what Paul is wanting us to see here. And if you would ask yourself the question, if you don't have any pushback in your life, no one disagrees with you, everyone agrees with your point of view, are you on mission? If you don't have any opponents, if you don't have anyone pushing against Jesus in your life, are you on mission? I want us to grow forward. Don't nasal gave. Don't get sad about this. Just ask the question and move. We move. Jesus is calling us, urging us, inviting us to participate with him in the development and growth of his kingdom. And if we're experiencing hostility in here and no hostility out there, then I wonder if unity isn't our issue, but it's a humility issue. Because we've made something so much more important to us than Jesus and his mission. And we need the gospel to bring humility. And thankfully it does. This isn't something that you have to produce. You don't have to produce the unity. You don't have to produce the bravery. And you don't have to produce the humility. You see Jesus' humility and you see what Jesus has done and it brings humility. So maybe what we need is a little bit more time spent on the good news of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Or the scope of God bringing all of history to bear and bringing all of history to where his kingdom will reign forever and ever. Where we don't have to worry about any single thing. And we get to bring people into that. Live unified. Live unafraid. Live unselfish. I'm always telling my team... Bring others with you. Talk up, don't talk down. Talk up, not down. It's so easy to think I did something great and they did something terrible and to just seethe and throw up my hands and get all angry and tell them some, just do this, blah, blah, blah. And that totally tanks our morale. And I fought that with my sixth graders again and again and again. They just couldn't beat the Mustangs. They were afraid. I finally gave them some gas. They were all excited. And uh, you'll never believe it. Hey, show them that first, oh, not the first picture, but the, the one on the, the, the next one. Can you, can, can you get up there? That one. Look at that. You know what we did? We lost. <laughs> we lost. You thought we won? Did you really think we beat the Mustangs? Are you crazy? God's real, but come on, man. Some things, you know, God, I don't know. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. That's not real. But we got second place. But let me tell you, the final score was seven to four. At different points, it was a legitimate game. And the refs kind of robbed us on a call. It's fine. It's fine. I'm not throwing, I'm not throwing fits. We lost the game. We lost. We lost. But it was seven to four. They believed. They fought. And I gassed them like I'd never gassed them before. I could cry right now. I was so proud of them. And we do this thing where we celebrate. I'm talking when we have a win, we celebrate like crazy. When it's your birthday, we celebrate you like, I'm talking, we go bananas. We get down real low and we say, sha la 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 la, fight warriors, fight. And we, sha la la, we get crazy. Show the next picture. So I celebrated like there was no tomorrow. That's the second place team. You know what the first place team did? They didn't even care. Who's the real winner? Who's the real winner? Right there. That's right. Because we knew what we were for, there for. We weren't there to win. That team could win without showing up. They don't even get to forfeit. They don't show up. They still win. We had to fight. We grew in character, and we built family. It was beautiful. And we have that very same opportunity, Disciple City Church. We don't have to win. We just have to fight. But we got to fight the right fight. We've got to stop 
fighting for me, and we have to start fighting for we. We have to start talking up, not talking down. We have to go together. Paul is urging us, remember who you are. You are citizens of heaven. So what is the call then? Live unified. Live unafraid. And live unselfish. If we can internalize that, if we could be marked by that, I mean, there's no stopping us. We might get second. Who cares? Yo, we lose the best. We got the best losses of all time. Because we knew what we were aiming for. We knew who we were. We knew what we needed to accomplish. And if we are one degree better every day, a little bit more unified, a little bit more brave, a little bit more humble, but a whole lot more family, oh, my God. There's no losing in that. We literally have Jesus. He's the king. Our future's set. What could really stand in our way? It's beautiful. So at Disciple City, we have a time of contemplation where we sit and we pause and we think and then we sing and there's people down here to pray. And as you sit and think, sometimes we say, what's God calling you to start, stop, believe, and share? But I want you to think, which of these three things, unity, bravery, and humility, which of these three things is what catches me up the most? Where do I get caught up? Which of these am I weakest in? And why? Just ruminate on that for a little bit. And then answer the question, who am I going to talk to about it? Because we don't do this thing alone. Amen? Love y'all.
Give it up for God, man, today. 
as I think about everything that we have experienced today and just listening to Seer's sermon, you know, just reminded me of we are powerful together and we are an unstoppable force when we are unified. I think that's the scariest thing that um, Satan realizes about the church is that when we are together, there's really nothing he can do. Even predators understand that, that when they see the herd, they are waiting on one to kind of isolate itself so that it can attack that one, you know. But when they are all together, um, there's no room for the hunt. And so one of the things that we um, have started here is um, ELP. What is ELP? You can get, get your husband. Hey, good job, brother. <laughs> you that was nice. Yeah. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Can y'all hear me in an enhanced way? Okay. A little louder. Okay, perfect. ELP. Can everyone say ELP? ELP. 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 Okay. ELP is elder-led prayer. Um, thank God for our elders. Um, yeah, we can clap for that. Um, this might be the last time they give me the mic, so I'm going to maximize it. Oh, Lord, okay? have mercy. Um, but I remember we had a, a house meeting maybe like a year or two ago, and um, they, they, they <laughs> made this mistake again. They were like, hey, so whoever wants to share, I'll, like, I'll take it. I love sharing. And I remember um, sharing and saying, okay, so I love how we say that, um, that this isn't like a family we are a family, but I have a little bit of a challenge with that because um, we were coming out of COVID. But I was like, I know my family. I don't awkwardly smile at them when I walk past the bathroom. Like, I I know what they're going through. Like, and, I, and it's hard because if I'm honest, I don't feel like I know a lot of people at this church. And like, when, what are we doing to facilitate that? And I remember everyone was like, oh, okay. And a year or so later, like, just to see, okay, we used to have Revive, which was awesome, but how many people went to Revive? Very limited. I only see a, a, a hand in here, and I understand, you know, there were some challenges with that, and I remember saying, you know what, this is the worst time on the literal calendar. It's like we selected the worst time, and um, hearing all that feedback and to see ELP come to be um, is really cool to say, hey, we're going to shift things around. Prayer is still a priority. Um, but we want opportunities for people to actually practice what we're talking about on Sunday, opportunities for people to be family, um, to come and receive prayer from our um, elders, but then also to pray together. Yeah. And I feel, I feel really blessed and encouraged that the feedback was received, and um, ELP is a result of that. And so I just wanted to share a little bit about it, socialize it with the group. Um, our next prayer gathering is February 28th. Um, it starts at 5.30, ends at 7.30 pretty promptly. There's an optional dinner at 5.30, so if you have to fight Dallas to get here, that's okay. You know, you can just come at like 6.15. I think that's when we start. Um, but the, the um, dinner is optional. There also will be child care um, for those who have little ones. But I want to appeal everybody to try to come. Um, it's something that we're doing. And when the family is gathering, let's try to be there. And so if there are things you can you can shift or, you know, if you just have to have that extra courage to come. Look, I'm the queen of coming to things with a bad attitude. So if you have a bad attitude, come talk to me. We'll work it out. A lot of times it changes by the end. So I get it. It's Wednesday. There's so many barriers. But, like, if we could all commit or some of us could commit to coming, I think it would be really beautiful. And um, for those that did come for our last one, I thought that it was really unscripted, just like a beautiful, intimate time before the Lord. Um, and that's all, we, that's all we have to do. We just have to put ourselves in a position to experience God, to be vulnerable with one another, and that that will prayerfully create a more intimate, vulnerable, unified body. And we can actually live out what we're, we've been hearing on Sunday. So ELP, February 28th, I'll be there. You might have a bad attitude. That's okay. <laughs> You can come. It's it's fine. Um, so just 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 to know. I don't what know about all this bad attitude talk that you're talking I about. Shade and I prayed together last time, it was and nice. I will never ever ever forget our prayer time. I cried. 
I don't, I don't think you cried, but she didn't have no bad attitude. So you can have a bad attitude and find Sade and she'll pray with you and it'll change your life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyways, yeah. So there's the LP. You know about it. Mark your calendars. Um, hope to see you there. Well, b before we, because Sade also leads out the testimony time, so you want to be there as well. But we have a picture because not only is it just for family, but our city youth also teaches the kids how to pray. And so if you look in this picture, you know, you see uh, little Theo, he is going in. You see, Who is that? You see your picture up there, Theo? He is going <laughs> in. Uh, and then uh, Sophia is cheering her on. Uh, she's wait, she's cheering him on and waiting on her turn. And then Solomon is like, right, really? Well, you going to take this long to pray? Come on, I'm ready, you know. So one of the things that we want to do with our city <laughs> youth is we don't want them to wait to go to college to learn what it means to disciple. We want to train them in discipleship right now. And so one of the outlets that we want to use during that time is to have them teach our their, their siblings, their baby siblings, how to pray. And so that's one of the aspects of city youth that we are picking up on. Thank you for adding that. I forgot. This is my daughter, Soraya. She was talking about that for days. She was like, Theo was so adorable <laughs> when he was praying. And when we prayed at night, they prayed for Theo. And um, I feel like that means more. I mean, I love the phrase, but that's like a family. And that's really encouraging to see God actually move in our kids and in the lives of people. And I know how to pray for y'all. I know how to pray for others um, because of that. So, so good. If you want to sign up for elder-led prayer for ELP, you can go on Church Center. It's the app that we use. And you'll also find a couple other things. Like if you're single and you want to meet some other singles, next Sunday afternoon, lunch is on us. We will have, hello, son, my other son. We will have uh, a brunch for the singles uh, come through. It'll be in the fellowship hall, as I understand it. If not, someone can yell at me and correct some stuff. Uh, but there's one thing that you'll find on there. You'll find Disciple Marriage. Uh, a course to help bolster and strengthen your marriage, whether your marriage is uh, on a peak, on a mountaintop, or in a valley. Uh, it's been so great. I think the curriculum has been really dope, and it's been helpful for my marriage, for marriages that we've walked with. Uh, but we had a dope event last night with the marriage ministry. Ooh, so uh, if ooh. that was fun, it wasn't me. Uh, if that was fun, got both my boys up here. If that was fun, then I think you might really love Disciple Marriage and the men's retreat. Men, come through. Sign up for the retreat. Let's get going. It's going to be awesome. Oh, I got to do the benediction, yes, too. You do. If you're a guest, thanks for being oh, here. Choir. Uh, also, remember, don't forget to sign up for choir. I hear so y'all were singing today. Y'all were singing today. Don't make me point you out. I heard some of you all today. You can hide that beautiful voice in the choir stand. Some of y'all stay in the pews, but you can sing for the pews. If you're a guest, this next part might be a little different, but they can tell you all about what it is at the Connect Center. Just go back there, meet a smiling face, find some information. This is just the benediction, a blessing. May the love of God and the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit go with God's people now and forevermore. Let all God's people say, Amen. Go be unified, unafraid, and unselfish. In Jesus' name, hug somebody don't look like you before you leave this place.